Welcome to Too Fond of Books. My name is Janelle and this is another World Book Day video. In today's video, I want to introduce you to three feisty female investigators. So the first feisty female investigator I want to introduce you to is Miss Seaton. This is Picture Miss Seaton by Heron Carvick. It's the first in a series of five that he wrote about Miss Seaton, who is a retired art teacher. Uh, she's very much like a Miss Marple. Uh, this book was written in 1968, and the series was continued by Hampton Charles. He wrote another three, and then Hamilton Crane wrote another 17 Miss Seaton uh, mysteries. And I love Miss Seaton. She is definitely feisty. Let me give you an example. Like Miss Marple, she lives in a uh, small English village. Good gracious, what was that? Miss Seaton, suddenly awake, found it difficult to orient herself. Of course, it was the hens. What a noise. Oh dear, really. She got quickly out of bed, into her slippers, pulled her dressing gown round her, and hurried down the stairs. Without stopping to put on a light, she instinctively snatched her umbrella from the drip tray in the passage as she passed, unlocked the kitchen door, and sped down the garden. No, really, it was too tiresome of them. Of course Nigel had warned her. Upsetting the hens like this? Well, she'd soon put a stop to it. Thank heavens there was enough moonlight to see one's way. Poor Stan, he'd be so cross. The squawking from the hen houses continued unabated. Miss Seaton arrived at the runs. She beat on the wire door with her umbrella. Stop that, she called. Stop that at once. Do you hear me? Sure, lady, I hear you. She gasped. A shadow moved forward, reached through the wire, and unhooked the door. With the moon behind him, Miss Seaton could see little but a dark shape muffled in a coat, a hat pulled low but the moon shone on the barrel of the pistol he held. Now take it easy. Now just take it nice and easy, lady. Back to the house and no noise, see? Don't be childish, she snapped, and put that toy away at once or I shall send for the police. She brought her umbrella down smartly on his wrist. There was a flash, a sharp blast. There was a howl of mingled rage and pain. The gun fell. Oh dear, cried Miss Seaton in startled dismay. I'm so sorry, I had no idea. I hope you didn't hurt yourself. She was talking to the air. The figure, dancing in wild abandon on one foot while clutching the other, had hurled itself at the hen house, heaved itself onto the roof and vanished over the wall. There was a thud, a yelp, a curse. There was stumbling footsteps, running footsteps. Windows thrown open, doors thrown open, the hens redoubled their efforts in the face of competition. People calling, what is it? Murder! Shots! A man's voice, quick, for God's sake, too quick, two loud reports, yells of pain, door slamming, engine revving, and trumpet tongued above the tumult, Sir George's triumphant bellow, got him, a barrel of buttock! <laughs> I love Miss Seaton. She's just like, she is so righteously indignant that there would be someone disturbing her hens in the hen house and completely oblivious to the danger to herself. Miss Seaton by Heron Carvick. The second feisty female investigator I want to introduce you to is Miss Polifax. This is The Unexpected Mrs. Polifax by Dorothy Gilman. This book is from 1966 and there are 14 in her series. This is a series that is set in the United States. And uh, let me introduce you to the wonderful Mrs. Polifax. On the following morning, Mrs. Polifax left by train for Washington. The first thing she did after registering at the hotel was to go by taxi to the Capitol building and visit her congressman. The next day was spent in sightseeing and in restoring her courage, which had a tendency to rise in her like a tide and then ebb, leaving behind tattered weeds of doubt. But on Thursday, after lunch, she resolutely boarded a bus for the 20-minute ride to Langley, Virginia, where the new headquarters of the Central Intelligence Agency had been built. Its address and location had been discovered by Mrs. Polifax in the public library, 
where she had exercised a great deal of discretion, even glancing over her shoulder several times as she copied it into her memo pad. Now she was astonished, even shocked, to see sign after sign along the road directing everyone, presumably Russians too, to the Central Intelligence Agency. Nor was there anything discreet about the building itself. It was enormous. Covers nine acres, growled the bus driver, and with its towers, penthouses, and floors of glass, it fairly screamed for attention. Mrs. Polifax realized that she ought to feel intimidated, but her courage was on the rise today. She was here now, and in such a glorious mood that only Miss Hartshorn could have squashed her, and Miss Hartshorn was several hundred miles away. Mrs. Polifax walked through the gates and approached the guards inside with her head high. I would like, she said, consulting her memo pad, to see Mr. Jaspar Mason. She was given a form to fill out on which she listed her name, her address, and the name of Mr. Mason, and then a guard in uniform escorted her down the corridor. Mrs. Polifax walked slowly, reading all the signs posted on how classified waste paper should be prepared for disposal, and at what hours it would be collected, and she decided that at the very least this was something that would impress Mrs. Hartshorn. The room into which Mrs. Polifax was ushered proved to be small, bright, and impersonal. It was empty of Mr. Mason, however, and from its contents, several chairs, a striped couch, and a mosaic coffee table, Mrs. Polifax deduced that it was a repository for those visitors who penetrated the walls of the Citadel without invitation. Mr. Mason contributed further to this impression when he joined her. He carried himself like a man capable of classifying and disposing of people as well as waste paper, but with tact, skill, and efficiency. He briskly shook her hand, glanced at his watch, and motioned her to a chair. I'm afraid I can give you only ten minutes, he said. This room is needed at two o'clock. But tell me, how can I help you? With equal efficiency, Mrs. Polifax handed him the introduction that she had extracted from her congressman. She had not told the congressman her real reason for wishing to interview someone in this building, but she had, but she had been compelling. The young man read the note, frowned, glanced at Mrs. Polifax, and frowned again. He seemed particularly disapproving when he looked at her hat, and Mrs. Polifax guessed that the single fuchsia pink rose that adorned it must be leaning again like a broken reed. Ah, yes, Mrs. Polifax, he murmured, obviously baffled by the contents of the introduction, which sounded in awe of Mrs. Polifax, and of Mrs. Polifax herself, who did not strike him as awesome at all. Polifax, she pointed out gently. Oh, sorry. Now, just what is it I can do for you, Mrs. Polifax? It says here that you are a member of a garden club of your city and are gathering facts and information. Mrs. Polifax brushed this aside impatiently. No, no, not really, she confided, and glancing around to be sure that the door was closed, she leaned toward him. In a low voice, she said, Actually, I've come to inquire about your spies. The young man's jaw dropped. I beg your pardon? Mrs. Polifax nodded. I was wondering if you needed any. He continued staring at her, and she wished that he would close his mouth. Apparently, he was very obtuse. Perhaps he was hard of hearing. Taking care to enunciate clearly, she said in a louder voice, I would like to apply for work as a spy. That's why I'm here, you see. The young man closed his mouth. You can't possibly. You're not serious, he said blankly. Yes, of course, she told him warmly. I've come to volunteer. I'm quite alone, you see, with no encumbrances or responsibilities. It's true that my only qualifications are those of character, but when you reach my age, character is what you have the most of. I've raised two children and run a home. I drive a car and no first aid. I never shrink from the sight of blood, and I'm very good in emergencies. Mr. Mason looked oddly stricken. He said in a dazed voice, But really, you know, spying these days is not bloody at all, Mrs. Mrs. Polifax, she reminded him. I'm terribly relieved to hear that, Mr. Mason, but still, I hoped that you might find use for someone, someone expendable, you know, if only to preserve the lives of your younger, better trained people. I don't mean to sound melodramatic, but I am quite prepared to offer you my life, or I would not have come. Mr. Mason looked shocked. 
But Mr. But Mrs. Politic, he protested, this is simply not the way in which spies are recruited. Not at all. I appreciate the spirit in which you... Then how? asked Mrs. Polifax reasonably. Where do I present myself? It's... Well, it's not a matter of presenting oneself. It's a matter of your country looking for you. Mrs. Polifax's glance was gently reproving. That's all very well, she said, but how on earth could my country find me in New Brunswick, New Jersey? And have they tried? Mr. Mason looked Wayne. Ah, uh, now I don't suppose... There, you see? Someone tapped on the door and a young woman appeared, smiling at them both, and said, Mr. Mason, I'm sorry to interrupt, but there's an urgent telephone call for you in your office. It's Miss Webster. Miss Webster, murmured Mr. Mason daz dazedly, and then... Good heavens, yes, Miss Webster. Where is Miss Webster? He jumped to his feet and said hastily, I must excuse myself. I'm so sorry, Mrs. Politic. Polifax, she reminded him forgivingly, and leaned back in her chair to wait for his return. Mrs. Polifax by Dorothy Gilman. And the third feisty female investigator I want to introduce you to is Miss Marple. Now, Miss Marple is feisty in a very different way to Mrs. Polifax and Miss Seaton. Uh, she's not quite as active. She doesn't do as much running around and whatnot, but she is still definitely what I would call a feisty investigator. This is a Caribbean mystery written in 1964, and there are 13 books in the Miss Marple series um, written by Agatha Christie. So, uh, let me introduce you to feisty Miss Marple. She got up and slowly went back to her bungalow. On the way, she passed Mr. Raphael and Esther Walters coming down the beach. Mr. Raphael winked at her. Miss Marple did not wink back. She looked disapproving. She went into her bungalow and lay down on her bed. She felt old and tired and worried. She was quite certain that there was no time to be lost. No time to be lost. It was getting late. The sun was going to set. The sun. One must always look at the sun through smoked glass. Where was that piece of smoked glass that someone had given her? No, she wouldn't need it after all. A shadow had come over the sun, blotting it out. A shadow. Evelyn Hill Hillingdon's shadow? No, not Evelyn Hillingdon. The shadow. What were the words? The shadow of the valley of death. That was it. She must... What was it? Make the sign of the horns to avert the evil eye? Major Palgrave's evil eye? Her eyelids flickered open. She had been asleep. But there was a shadow, someone peering in at her window. The shadow moved away, and Miss Marple saw who it was. It was Jackson. Impertinence, peering in like that, she thought and added parenthetically, just like Jonas Perry. The comparison reflected no credit on Jackson. Then she wondered why Jackson had been peering into her bedroom, to see if she was there, or to note that she was there but asleep. She got up, went into the bathroom, and peered cautiously through the window. Arthur Jackson was standing by the door of the bungalow next door, Mr. Raphael's bungalow. She saw him give a rapid glance around and then slip quickly inside. Interesting, thought Miss Marple. Why did he have to look around in that furtive manner? Nothing in the world could have been more natural than his going into Mr. Raphael's bungalow, since he himself had a room in the back of it. He was always going in and out of it on some errand or other. So why that quick, guilty glance round? Only one reason, said Miss Marple, answering her own question. He wanted to be sure that nobody was observing him enter at this particular moment because of something he was going to do in there. Everybody, of course, was on the beach at this moment, except those who had gone for expeditions. In about 20 minutes or so, Jackson himself would arrive on the beach in the course of his duties to aid Mr. Raphael to take his sea dip. If he wanted to do something in the bungalow unobserved, now was a very good time. He had satisfied himself that Miss Marple was asleep on her bed, he had satisfied himself that there was nobody near at hand to observe his movements. Well, she must do her best to do exactly that. Sitting down on her bed, Miss Marple removed her neat sandal shoes and replaced them with a pair of sneakers. 
Then she shook her head, removed the sneakers, bur burrowed in her suitcase, and took out a pair of shoes, the heel on one of which she had recently caught on a hook by the door. It was now in a slightly precarious state, and Miss Marple adroitly rendered it even more precarious by attention with a na nail file. Then she emerged with due precaution from her door, walking in stockinged feet, with all the care of a big game hunter approaching un upwind of a herd of antelope, Miss Marple gently circumnavigated Mr. Raphael's bungalow. Cautiously she maneuvered her way around the corner of the house. She put on one of the shoes she was carrying, gave a final wrench to the heel of the other, gently sank to her knees and lay prone under the, under the window. If Jackson heard anything, if he came to the window to look out, an old lady would have had a fall owing to the heel coming off her shoe. But evidently Jackson had heard nothing. Very, very gently, Miss Marple raised her head. The windows of the bungalow were low. Shielding herself slightly with a festoon of creeper, she peered inside. Jackson was on his knees before a suitcase. The lid of the suitcase was up, and Miss Marple could see that it was a specially fitted affair containing compartments filled with various kinds of papers. Jackson was looking through the papers, occasionally drawing documents out of long envelopes. Miss Marple did not remain at her observation po post for long. All she wanted was to know what Jackson was doing. She knew now, Jackson was snooping. Whether he was looking for something in particular or whether he was just indulging his natural instincts, she had no means of judging. But it confirmed her in her belief that Arthur Jackson and Jonas Perry had strong affinities in other things than facial resemblance. Her problem was now to withdraw. Very carefully, she dropped down again and crept along the flower bed until she was clear of the window. She returned to her bungalow and carefully put away the shoe and the heel that she had detached from it. She looked at them with affection, a good device which she could use on another day if necessary. She resumed her own sandal shoes and went thoughtfully down to the beach again. So, Miss Marple, a feisty female investigator. So, I hope that you check out Miss Marple, Miss Seaton, and Mrs. Polifax, and I'll see you for another video again soon. Bye.